I am very excited about this new series that we're starting. It's going to go about seven or eight weeks. And it is going to allow Brother James and I just to spend some time in prayer and find out what psalm the Lord lays on our heart in order for us to, to walk through them and study them and magnify the Lord and see the greatness of our God in every single one of these. I have chosen Psalm 135 for our text this morning, so if you will turn with me to Psalm 135. We're going to read the whole thing before we break it down and discuss it. Just a reminder, every time in your English Bible you see the word Lord and the L and the O and the R and the D are capitalized, it is the word Yahweh. Psalm 135, we're going to read the entire chapter, obviously beginning in verse 1. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Give praise, O servants of the Lord, who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing to his name, for it is pleasant. For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel as his own possession. For I know that the Lord is great and that our Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all the deeps. He it is who makes the clouds rise, the end of the earth, who makes lightning for the rain, who brings forth the wind from its storehouses. He it was who struck down the firstborn of Egypt, both of man and of beast, who in your midst, O Egypt, sent signs and wonders against Pharaoh and all his servants, who struck down many nations, who killed mighty kings, Sihon, king of the Amorites, and all king of Bashan, and all the kingdoms of Canaan, and gave their land as a heritage, a heritage to his people Israel. Your name, O Lord, endures forever. Your renown, O Lord, throughout all ages. For the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants. The idols of the nations are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak. They have eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear, nor is there any breath in their mouths. Those who make them become like them, and so do all who trust in them. O house of Israel, bless, bless the Lord. O house of Aaron, bless the Lord. O house of Levi, bless the Lord. You who fear the Lord, bless the Lord. Blessed be the Lord from Zion who dwells in Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Let's pray and then we'll talk about this. Lord, I come to you and I thank you for this beautiful song. Lord, a song that you have given us to contemplate and to think about and Lord, to put to music. God, I just pray that you would help us today as we work through this text to see how great you are, how wonderful you are, that we would be moved to praise you like never before. We ask you these things in Jesus' name. Amen. There was a man by the name of David Livingston. David Livingston was a Scottish missionary and doctor who in 1840 began his work in the southern interior, interior of Africa. He would be used by God for over 30 years to bring the gospel and anti-slavery movement and medicine to many African people. He was determined to open a path to the interior of Africa to bring all of these things to many of the people there. It was in this context that he uttered this now famous statement, I shall open a path to the interior or perish. One of his last journeys, he hadn't been heard from in three years. No correspondence back and forth to his family, nothing for three years. It seemed to disappear when finally Henry Stanley, a correspondent from New York Herald, 
found him and greeted him with this famous quote. You may know what it is. Dr. Livingston, I presume. When he found him, he was very, very ill. He was very sick. Stanley brought much needed food and medicine, and Livingston soon recovered from his severe sickness. And Stanley begged him, please come back to England with me. You're going to get sick again. You're going to die out here. Please come with me back to England. But Livingston refused. And he stayed in Africa for three more years before May of 1873, he fell ill again. This time he would not recover and he was found, passed away at his bedside on his knees in prayer. He literally gave his life for the African people. During his life in ministry, he journaled a great deal. He wrote a great deal about his mission and about his journeys. And he, he journaled this, that before he started his entire mission back in 1840, he wrote and recited and prayed Psalm 135. This exact psalm that we just read was the motivation, at least in part, for his missionary journeys into Africa. This very same psalm that we study today motivated his ministry. And it is a psalm that does indeed motivate. It motivates, namely, worship. It uses the term praise 11 times. Up to this point, Psalm 120 to Psalm 134 are all songs of ascent. But when you get to Psalm 135, this begins the last section of the book of Psalms, and they are all songs enticing and imploring and motivating praise and worship. Every phrase in this psalm is used somewhere else in Scripture. And while it is a less known psalm to many of us, it is a beautiful song and worthy of our focus this morning, and it would be as dear to us as it was to Dr. Livingston. Let me read verses 1 and 2 once again, and then we'll look at the invocation. Brother James is going to be so excited. I have three I words today to give you. Let's read verses 1 and 2 again. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Give praise, O servants of the Lord, who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. While not all worship is praise, all praise is what? Worship. And so this psalm begins with an appeal. An invocation is an appeal. And here he's appealing to worship. Worship with me. Praise with me. When the English language was originally written, there was no word worship. Instead, it was worth-ship. Worship came later. It was worth-ship. It was praising something based upon its worth, based upon its weight, the weight that it carried. This is where we get our word worship, from worth-ship. So here we are told that we are to praise and worship the Lord. That means that there is nothing worth more in our lives, nothing that carries the weight in our lives in the entire universe more than the name of the Lord. Amen? Nothing should carry more weight. Nothing should be more worth of worth to you than the name of the Lord. And here the psalmist is saying, you need to, to have so much worth that you praise the Lord. He is supremely worthy. That is why we use the term around here, treasure. I will use it often. We are to treasure the Lord. We are to see Jesus as the greatest treasure in the universe. 
Because what we're trying to, to instill, the idea that we're trying to get in all of our minds is that there is no greater treasure than the name of the Lord. I love that the psalmist uses the phrase, name of the Lord. It speaks of the essence of who he is. It speaks of his actions. When you say the name of the Lord, you're saying praise him for who he is, for the essence of his being, and for the way that he acts toward us. The way that he acts toward his creation. So we praise the Lord for who he is, and we praise the Lord for what he does. As servants, this is our service. Look at what it says. It says, O servants of the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the name of the Lord, give praise, O servants of the Lord. Now, when you hear the term servant, sometimes you can have thoughts that may, um, may imply some kind of um, demeaning nature, right? Oh, a servant is someone who is demeaned, someone who is low. But notice what these servants are doing. These servants are standing in the house of the Lord. These servants are in the court of the house of the Lord. We are not servants out of fear. We are servants because we have been brought into an intimate relationship with our God. We have been brought into this intimate relationship, brought into the house to live with him and serve him, even calling almighty Yahweh our God. In every commentary that I read, every one of them pointed out the importance of this personal language. Yahweh is not just simply some kind of transcendent God that is huge and big and off somewhere that we can't really relate to. No, Yahweh is intimately involved in our lives. We talk often about, especially with our life groups, we've been talking about opening up our lives to let other people into it and then opening up space for us to step into it. The idea that Almighty God opened up his house and opened up his courts to allow you into it, to intimately relate to him. The transcendent God that is holy and set apart and completely other has brought you into his house. So we do not serve out of fear. We serve because he is our God. This was revolutionary to relate to, to God as our God. The pagans didn't do this. The pagans had no such idea of being in the intimate relationship with the house of their gods. I want to mention that the term praise is mentioned how many times in these first couple verses? Three. And I love what Charles Spurgeon wrote about this. So I, I, he takes this idea of three and he, he writes this beautiful Sentence in his commentary. He says this, let the three in one have the praises of our spirit, soul, and body for past, present, and the future. Let us render threefold. Hallelujah. Spurgeon. Let the three in one have the praises of our spirit, soul, and body for past, present, and the future. Let us render threefold. Hallelujah. But not only do we have the invocation, right, the appeal to praise, we have the impetus, impetus. So proud of myself, guys. <laughs> impetus is something that, you know how I came up with this. <laughs> I want to tell on myself. Because I guarantee here's what Brother James does. Brother James sits in his office, and he just thinks. And he probably just thinks about a word and that will work. That's the same letter. And he thinks about what that word means. You know what I do? I go to dictionary.com and I put in the word encourage synonym. And I just find one that started with an I. So I'm telling on myself, I don't do it the same way Brother James does it. 
But nevertheless, impetus is a good word to use here. It is a word that means to arouse to action. Something that arouses action. And that's what the psalmist begins doing in verse 3. He begins to give us things that should arouse this praise in us. I'm going to give you reasons that you should be moved to praise our God. There are at least five of them. The first one is found in verse 3. His goodness. We are to praise our God for his goodness. That is a reason why you should be moved to the action of praise. Verse 3, praise the Lord for he is good. Sing to his name for it is pleasant. Do you know the word God in English is just a shortened word for good? We came up with the word God to refer to the higher power from the word good. He is good. Our God is good. Yahweh is good. Jesus is good. He is good in nature and he is good in all of his ways. His wisdom, his knowledge, his judgments, his power, they are all good. And listen to this. There is nothing that has happened. Listen carefully. There is nothing that has happened up to this point in the history, in God's story that he is writing. That he could have done any better. Think about that. There is nothing that God could have done any better. Why? Because every time he acts, it is perfectly good. Every time. That is so hard for us to fathom because we are so used to being motivated to do something good, but then getting done and going, God, I could have done that better. Man, I, I could have I maybe said that differently or I could have maybe uh, not messed up on the song, Angela. You know, we could have done that better. I'm just kidding, Angela. We could have done that better. I would only do that to Angela, okay? Maybe to Shelby. But not for God. Every time God acts, which by the way, he is acting every millisecond in a million different ways, not only in your life, but in the life of all of his people on the planet. All of the billions of people who have come before us that love Jesus Every single action that he did for them, he could not have done it better. It was perfectly good. That should blow our minds. That right now, God is working perfectly good in your life. And the next millisecond, on the million of levels that he's working for you, every one of those is good. He cannot do anything better than he does it every single time. He is always infinitely good. And he's good in our salvation. He is good in the way that he chose to save us. And both our praise, both our singing to his name, and his name which is good is pleasant. And we should praise him for his goodness. Amen? Amen? Number two, his elective love. Look at verse four. For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel for his own possession. Number two is his elective love. I'm going to make a statement, and it's a massively important statement, and then I'm going to back it up. Election is the most adoring aspect of God's love. Listen carefully. Election, God's sovereign election, is the most adoring aspect of God's love. God chooses to love unconditionally. And what that means is that God's love is not based on what you have done or what you should have done or what you could have done or what you have not done. 
God chooses to love simply because God chooses to love. There is nothing in the object of the love that makes God love it. Nothing outside of himself. This is what we call impassibility. It's a theological term, impassibility, which means nothing outside of God can cause him to act. Every time God acts, he chooses to act. He acts upon his own volition and will, not because anything outside of him forces him to do so. It's called impassibility. It's a great theological word. No one forces God to love. And God did not choose Israel because Israel was beautiful and great and wonderful. He chose Israel because he chose Israel. In fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 7, here's what it says. God speaking to Israel. It, is, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. You were the fewest of all the people. In other words, God didn't look at Israel and go, wow. Israel, you are so great. I got to love you. That's why we use the language of Scripture that says he set his love upon them. We're so used to emotional love. And I'm not saying that's wrong. But we're so used to that, that when we think of love, we think of looking at something that stirs our affections in such a way that we have to love it. It's not how God works. He is completely other than and holy when it comes to his love. His love is not because he looks at you and is overwhelmed with with how beautiful you are or how wonderful you are or how great you are. It's not what he did with Israel. He looked at Israel and said, Israel, you are the weakest. You're the most pathetic. You're the smallest. And I chose to love you anyway. Now, that's true in our election as well. Our election as the culmination of the Jewish story in Christ, Paul actually uses Jacob as an example. Jacob's name gets turned into what? Israel. Paul is going to use Jacob as an example of God's unconditional love for his people. In Romans chapter 9, verses 10 through 12, here's what Paul writes. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born, had done nothing either good or bad, But in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger. He chose Jacob and not Esau. Why? Did he look at Jacob and go, Jacob, you're just going to be so awesome. Jacob was anything but awesome. That dude was a little sneaky Backstab, backstabbing, backstab, backstabbing little punk. And God chose him over Esau. Why? Well, Paul says, so that God's elective love would continue. What reason? God chose to do it. There was nothing in Jacob that made God go, ooh, I got to choose you, not Esau. Now, what Paul is doing is he's using that as the example for our election. Jacob and Esau had done nothing good or bad. Yet they had not been born. God did not choose Jacob because Jacob had done a bunch of good deeds and Esau didn't do a bunch of good deeds. And Paul is using that to say this Christian, you are a Christian not because God looked at you and thought this person is going to believe in me or they're going to have faith or they're going to be good or they're going to be great or no. None of those reasons are why you were chosen to be in the kingdom of God. You were chosen to be in the kingdom of God because God set his love on you, period. That's why it is of grace. 
He did not look down the corridors of time to see how you're going to behave to choose. That would make this example have no meaning. Because Paul says, having done nothing yet good or bad. God chose Jacob and not Esau. This is why Well, let me say this. There's this language that God uses in the Old Testament. Peter's going to use it in the New Testament to refer to the people he chooses. We read Deuteronomy 7.7. 7. Deuteronomy 7.6 7 says this. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Chose Israel and not the other nations. To be his treasured people. And then Peter in the New Testament uses the same language where he says this in 1 Peter 2.9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his treasured possession. You were selected the same way God selected the nation of Israel. He set his love upon you. It is unconditional. And do you know why it is beautiful? Because if it wasn't unconditional, you would go to hell. If it was not unconditional elective love, you would go to hell. Because if God was going to have to look at you in order to choose you, you would not be chosen. That is why I started this point by saying, Election is the most adoring aspect of God's love because if it's not true, you go to hell. If God doesn't set his love on you by his own choice, you would go to hell. Number three, his sovereign power. Look at verses five through seven. For I know that the Lord is great and that the Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord does, he pleases in heaven and on earth, in the seas and in the deeps. He it is who makes the clouds rise at the end of the earth, who makes the lightning for the rain and brings forth the wind from his storehouses. God's sovereign power, the psalmist is going to use nature as the demonstration of God's power and rule over the earth. Church, do you amen this sentence? God rules the heavens and the earth. All of it? Is there just part that he's in control of or is he in control of it all? Even when we watch it and go, how is God in control of that? Is he in charge of it? Yes, because he has infinite power. And here the psalmist is going to use nature to reveal this to us. Seas, clouds, lightning, rain, wind show that the Lord is all powerful. The forces of the heavens and the earth are not simply ruled by natural laws. A hurricane just came into the Gulf. It flooded Houston. It flooded some other cities. It did some, some severe damage. That hurricane was not simply functioning by the laws of nature. God controls the laws of nature. God was in charge of that hurricane. You better believe that, church. Because if you don't believe it, then we are cast into this infinite story where basically things are just happening to us and God's going, well, I don't really want that to happen and I got the power to stop it, but I just can't. You better hold tightly to the truth that if God sends a hurricane to where I live, he's in charge of that hurricane and the tornado and the flooding and everything else. Now, we may not know what he is doing and when he is doing it, and that's where we get in trouble when we start trying to to say why God's doing stuff. So every time you're on the Internet and somebody comes up and, and jumps out and says, here's why God is doing this, you should delete that person. That person has no clue why God is doing it. 
I remember after 9-11, everybody started popping off that the reason why 9-11 happened was because of homosexuality in the United States of America. Nobody knows that. Nobody knows that. Could it have been? Sure. That's God's call. I don't have the ability to know that. I remember when Katrina hit New Orleans. Oh, man, people, you know why it happened? Because of how wicked New Orleans is. Except for the part they left out that the Ninth Ward, which is actually, you know, is it Bourbon Street? What? The worst place in New Orleans didn't get flooded. So God was like, I'm going to get all those people except the really bad ones. We're foolish when we do that because we don't know. Here's what we know. God was in charge of Katrina. God was in charge of anything that happens on the earth. We just don't always know why he's doing what he's doing. But we cling to the foundation that God's in charge of it. God is in charge of it. And he does all that he pleases. They are under his control and they obey his commands. Say, Neil, how do you know that? Well, because when Jesus was standing on a boat and he told the wind to stop, guess what the wind did? It stopped. The wind didn't go, natural laws, Jesus. This storm's already kicked up. You're just going to have to let it play out. No, when Jesus says wind, you're going to stop. Guess what the wind does? It stops. He is the foundation that undergirds the laws of nature. We are to praise him for his power. Number four, his historical authorship. Verses 8 through 12 lays out God going and and doing what he did with Egypt and and, uh, the king of Sion, the king of Bashan, which were the first two nations that rose up against Israel unprovoked after they were freed from, from Egypt. This reveals to us that not only is God in charge of the forces of nature, he is in control of all human history. Amen, church? In charge of all human history. He struck down the firstborn of Egypt. He sent plagues upon them as judgment. He defeated them at the Red Sea in order to free Israel. The kingdoms of Canaan that are mentioned here were taken over. They had taken over the land that was given to Abraham and his descendants. And God wiped them out in judgment. The declaration of Nebuchadnezzar is powerful. He makes this declaration and then he gets his mind back. Okay? Remember the story. His rebellion, his usurping, trying to usurp the throne of God, thinking that he is king and he is Lord and he is the ruler. God sent him out into the the field for seven years like an animal. His hair grew long and his his fingernails grew long. He was a wild animal out of his mind. And he makes a declaration at the end of the seven years. And then his mind returns to him. And here's the declaration. He says of God, Yahweh, the God of Daniel. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom endures from all generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. He does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? And then his mind comes back to him. Because that's the place all of our minds should be in. If we are in our right mind, that is what we believe. God does all that he pleases in heaven and on earth in the inhabitants of men and he does what he wants in his sovereign will and none of us can say to him, what have you done? We are to praise him. I wrote this at the end here. Of course, the greater Joshua has been seated at the right hand of the Father. He was the only one able to open the scroll and rule human history in his sovereignty, and we are to praise him for it. 
Do you remember John in Revelation? When the scroll is presented and there is no one found to open it? I believe that scroll is referring to human history. To the rule of of human history. Who is in charge? Who can open it? Who, Who is going to bring about good for the Lord and for his people? And no one is able to open it. And John falls and he's weeping and he's crying. And then he looks up and sees one like a lamb slain. And everybody begins to sing, he is worthy to take the scroll and open its seals. He's the only one who is worthy to rule human history. And he's seated at the right hand of the Father, and we are to praise him for it. And then lastly, verses 13 and 14. Your name, O Lord, endures forever. Your renown, O Lord, throughout all ages. For the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants. Number five, his everlasting fame. The reason why God must be in charge of everything. The reason why God must be in charge of your salvation and setting his love on you. The reason why God must be in charge of all of the forces of nature. The reason why God must be in charge of all of human history is because his glory and the fame of his name are at stake. His name will endure forever. He never changes. His honor is eternal. He will never give his glory to another. God is doing what he is doing so that he gets all the glory and praise and honor given to him. And no man gets it. When it is all said and done and the human story has been written and God has done everything perfectly good the entire time. No one is going to say to God, you should have written this story a little bit differently. No one is going to say to God, you shouldn't let that happen. You should have stopped that. If you were good, this would not have happened. We will all say when it is said and done, this was the perfect story. And all glory and honor and power and wisdom and might belongs to you and you alone. And nobody else is going to get the glory for human history but you. And what is beautiful is that in the midst of writing this story, he has compassion on his people and he vindicates them. Meaning, when it is all said and done and we've held to these truth, these doctrines and these these things so tightly and we say, yes, God is in control. Yes, God is good. Yes, God is powerful. Yes, God is great. And we cling to these things. When it is all said and done, he's going to vindicate us because we were right to trust him. We were right to trust him. He's going to prove us right. That's what the vindication means. We've clung to him, sometimes not having a clue what he is doing and, and, and actually saying to him, Lord, we don't get it. We don't get it. What is happening? We don't understand. But we're going to trust you anyway. And one day we'll be vindicated for that faith. And then the last I, the idols. This was an easy one. I didn't have to. Go to dictionary.com. It's the second word in verse 15, so it's pretty easy. The psalmist now moves to compare the idols of the nations with the God that he's just talked about. And he points out a major problem with the idols. They're not real. They're not real gods. That's the major problem with the idols is that they're not real gods. They're not gods at all. They are made by human hands with natural elements. They have mouths but cannot speak. They have eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear. They are not alive. And look at what happens to the people that worship idols. They become like what they worship. This is a theological principle that you can trace through the entirety of Scripture. You become like what you worship, what you find worthy, what you find as a treasure, the thing that you are beholding in your life, you become like that thing. That's why for Christians, who do we behold as the greatest? Jesus. And who do we become like in the end? We are conformed in the image of God's Son, Jesus Christ. 
we become like what we behold. But if you behold idols and false gods, you become like those idols and false gods. You become impotent and empty and void of life. You will have a mouth, but you won't pray to Yahweh. You will have eyes, but you won't see the truth. You will have ears, but you will not hear the voice of God. Human beings who worship anything or behold anything other than God will become like what they worship. So I hear, here's what I want to say. Choose. Everyone in this room, choose. Everyone that's going to watch this online or listen to it online, and I know our sphere of influence is small, but whoever gets to hear this, choose. Who are you going to find worthy? The one true living God who is good and loving and powerful and sovereign and full of everlasting glory or the mute, blind, deaf, dead, false gods of this world. Choose who you're going to worship. And if you choose the one true living God, then praise his holy name. With everything you are, worship him and praise him for who he is and what he has done. And the nations will see that our God reigns. And one day we will be vindicated for choosing Yahweh. One day we will be vindicated for our faith in the one true living God. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise him, O servants of God. Praise his name.